We constantly hear from both religious leaders and governmental leaders that Islam is a religion of peace. Is it really? Our special guest today was a professor of Islamic history at Al Hazar University in Cairo, Egypt. He says that the history of Islam is a river of blood. Stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope. I am Dave Reagan, Senior Evangelist for Lamb and Lion Ministries, and I am delighted to have with me this week a very special guest by the name of Mark Gabriel. Mark is a former professor of Islamic history at Al Hazar University in Cairo, Egypt, the world's premier Islamic university. Welcome to Texas, Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me on this program. Well, Mark, uh, is this your first visit to Texas? Uh, no, this is actually second visit to uh, to Dallas. I see. Okay. But I visit te Texas, uh, especially Houston, oh. uh, more than once. Did you know that Texans refer to Texas as God's country? <laughs> this is first time I know that. <laughs> you, you know That's, that. Yeah. <laughs> you know how t proud Texans are of Texas, huh? Amen. Okay. Folks, uh, Mark has very graciously agreed to do two interviews with us. This week we're going to focus on his remarkable personal story and what it reveals about the nature of Islam. Next week, the Lord willing, we will discuss with Mark the nature of the Quran and the contrast between Muhammad and Jesus. But before I ask Mark my first question, let me point out that he is a very gifted writer. Since he came to this country just a few years ago, he has written several bestsellers. The first one, this one, Islam and Terrorism, is really fantastic. And he has written some others. For example, he has written one, the second one was called Islam and the Jews, and the next one was called Jesus and Mohammed. This is his newest book that has just come out. Later in our program, we'll tell you how you can get a copy of Islam and Terrorism. It is must reading for anyone who wants to understand the war against terrorism in which this nation is engaged. Mark, let's begin by talking about your upbringing in Egypt. Uh, were you born and raised in Cairo? No, actually I was born uh, in the south part of Egypt, and my family was moved to Cairo when I was almost uh, 14 years old. Oh, when yes. you were 14? Yes. Okay. Were your parents strict Muslims? They are. Uh, very devout. Not the secular type of Muslim that we often encounter um, in this no, country. No, no. In fact, you had an uncle who was an imam, wasn't he? He's a clerk, yeah, Muslim clerk and uh, imam also. Wasn't he the yes. one who first began to inspire you to uh, memorize the Quran? Yes, he took me when I was five years old and he started helping me memorizing the, uh, the Quran. And is it true that by the time you were 12 years old that you had the Quran memorized? Absolutely. I spent uh, almost seven years exactly to finish memorizing the entire book. Now, uh, Mark, yes. I have a copy of the Quran that is about yes. that thick, and yes. it's in very small print. <laughs> yes. We're talking about quite a lot of material there. Exactly. The size of the Quran actually is exactly like the size of the New Testament. So you had a book, the equivalent of the New Testament in length, exactly. memorized by the time you were 12 years old. By heart, absolutely. And you yes. had it memorized in classical Arabic, right? Exactly, because the language of the Quran, it's classic Arabic. It's not dialect Arabic. It's not the, the Arabic you speak on the streets. No, absolutely and not. And probably at the age yes. of 12, you didn't understand all that, did you? No. Even, even when I finished uh, my secondary school, uh, only when I start to really, um, my high school, I start to recognize the meaning of um, the verses of the Quran and the yes. teaching of the Quran. But it was a development, you see, from uh, the time I finished the Quran when I was 12 years old, till I finished my bachelor degree. It, the, from time to time it was a development taking place in understanding the meaning of this yes. book. But when I finished my bachelor degree, I was already um, have the proper understanding of the meaning of this book. And why was it important for you to memorize the Quran as a child? Why, why did anybody put any importance on that? Was, is that something important in Islamic society? 
Uh, this is actually, um, it came as a culture, mainly it's Islamic culture. And it wasn't just from the past 10 years or 50 years. It's from the very early time, the first century of Islam. Muslims start to take care of giving the Quran from generation to generation I see. by memorizing the book by heart. Okay. Yes. Now, were you ever exposed to any Christians while you were growing up, either missionaries or Coptic uh, Christians, uh, the, the basic Christianity of, of Egypt? Uh, absolutely. I saw um, Christians living in my neighborhood, living in my country, Egypt, as minority. But the things that uh, Christianity in Egypt uh, didn't have really the power to influence Muslims and uh, this is the reason why I wasn't influenced by this type of Christianity during all my life because the Christianity in Egypt is so tradition. Yes. M more than 90% of Egyptian Christians, they are tradition. Uh, there A is very liturgical type Exactly. Of yes. But there is one incident happened when I was a little child with a Christian priest from that church. That, that what happened in that time really was uh, left a huge influence over my spiritual life. Tell us about it. Um, I was really um, become very upset and very angry, uh, you see, um, of Christians and the Jews because of the teaching I started to receive every day in my school, especially when I was in my secondary school at Al Azhar um, Islamic Institute. Um, so one day I decided really to um, fire the Christians. And so I find a Christian priest in that church was using the road outside of my house, going from his place to his monastery every day. So every day I stand in front of my house and I start to just hit him with the, um, with the stones and with, you see. How old were you at that time? And that time I was 13 years old. And you're throwing stones at a I, Coptic absolutely. priest? Absolutely, and I injured his head. I oh. injured him in his head terribly, and they took him to the hospital. But this man, when he get out of the hospital, he just came just to find out what's going on with me, why I'm treating him that way. came back and found you? Yes, <laughs> yes. And uh, he know my house, he know my family even. So anyway, this man, he didn't come to revenge or to treat me in the same way, but he came to advise me that there is a fire inside me, and that fire is going to burn me mm. before burning others. Wow. So, and he came to show me or to tell me that he forgive me. Even I injured him and I caused big injury to him. He just came to show me that he loves me, he forgive me, and he said there is no reason for you to hate me or to treat me that way. That really impressed you, didn't it? Absolutely. This is what really influenced my spiritual life even when I grow up and I become one of the best students in my university. Now you were basically sitting on top of the world as a person who was a professor of Islamic history at Al-Azhar University. You were also a Muslim imam uh, at yes. a, a mosque in Giza, right? Yes, Giza City, uh, yes. I mean, you had all the prestige in the world, and yet one day you made a comment. Uh, I think I, I had it marked here. It's in your latest book, uh, Jesus and Muhammad. You were you were a person who questioned things, and you were told at the university, you don't question. You were told that. Exactly. You don't question, and you kept questioning. And one day in a conversation with colleagues, you made this statement, we say the Quran is directly from Allah, but I doubt it. I see in it the thoughts of man and not the words of God. Absolutely. And the moment those words came out of your mouth, you knew your fate was sealed, right? Absolutely. What happened that night? Um, and uh, this is... Well, uh, this is what happened in a meeting between me and other professors from the university. And uh, they just uh, met with me and they discussed um, what is going on and what they right. heard from the student. They was think that um, I, I've been under pressure of foreigner influence or um, Christian influence. or So they just want to find out why I'm doubting Islam, why I'm just... Right. So, and I said that this statement to and them... And then what happened that night? Uh, they become very upset. They kicked me out of the university. They fired me. The university fired me. And uh, in the same day, in evening time, I was kidnapped by Egyptian secret police because they accused me that I convert from Islam. 
We'll come back in just a moment, yes. and I want you to tell us what happened to you when you were kidnapped by the uh, secret police. Folks, uh, we are going to take a brief break at this point, and when we return, we'll hear the incredible story of what happened to Mark simply because he questioned some aspects of Islam. Mark Gabriel's fascinating story about his pilgrimage from Islam to Christianity is told in detail in this book, Islam and Terrorism. It is a story so fascinating that you will not be able to put the book down. It's one of the few books that I have ever completely read through all at one time. In addition to his personal story, Mark clearly shows that terrorism is an inherent part of true Islam. And in the process, he clearly proves that Islam is anything but a religion of peace. The book is easy to read. It will open your eyes to the truth about Islam. You will come to understand that we are really not in a war against terrorism. Rather, our war is with fundamentalist Islam. Terror is the method of our enemy. Terror is not the enemy. To get a copy of this book, give us a call at the number you see on the screen. The book can be yours for a donation of $15 or more, including the cost of shipping. I want to personally invite you to attend our annual Bible conference that we are going to host in Dallas, Texas area the last week in June on Friday and Saturday the 24th and 25th. The theme of the conference will be Christianity in Crisis. It will begin on Friday evening, June 24th, with a concert by the great Christian recording artist Dallas Holm, who was inducted into the Christian Music Hall of Fame in 2007. We are going to have six featured speakers at the conference. I will be one of them. Another will be Kirby Anderson, who is the National Director of Probe Ministries. He will speak on the challenge of Islam. Another of our guest speakers will be Frank Wright, who is the President of the National Religious Broadcasters. His presentation will be concerned with the challenge of government. Still another speaker will be John Morris, who is the President of the Institute for Creation Research. He will be speaking on the challenge of evolution. The topic, the challenge of apostasy, will be covered by James Walker, the President of Watchman Fellowship, which is an apologetics and discernment ministry. Finally, we will hear from Ron Rhodes, the President of Reasoning from the Scripture ministries. He will speak on the challenge of humanism and atheism. The conference will be free of charge, but is necessary for you to register. You can find the registration information on our website at lamblion.com, or you can call us at 972-736-3567. We will also be featuring throughout the conference the singing of Jack Hollinsworth of Acts 29 Ministries. Jack is the singer that we have featured the most on this television program. Now, you were telling us that you were arrested by the secret police of the Egyptian government for simply questioning some of the principles of Islam. What happened to you after that arrest? Um, they put me in the uh, little cell in, uh, in the, uh, uh, sec the headquarters of Egyptian secret service in the middle or the center of Cairo. Uh, they put me for three days with no food, with no water. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the fourth day, they start to interrogate me. They took me to one of the offices, maybe it's in the six or the seven floors, and uh, inter interrogating me during a day. And that fourth day, they start giving me food and water, and because they want to uh, stimulate me and just want to get information that they can. And uh, they find out during the day they cannot just get what they, they're looking for. And they start interrogating me during the evening time. So the evening time, it was the time of torture. Mm. Um, with the cigarette, they burned me with the cigarette in different places in my, my body. Mm -hmm. And you can see here in uh, my hand, um, they, um, they beat me, um, they put me in cold water, they put me in a little, uh, 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 in, a, in a tank full, you see, um, filled with water, and they put uh, hungry rats inside that tank, and they put me inside the tank. So you had rats for crawling over night. you? All night? Whole night, and the rats just swimming over the water, you see, around my head. And Did the rats bite you? No, well, no, 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 at all. This no. is like Daniel and the lion's den. And uh, <laughs> the next day they took me out, and uh, I was just um, surprised that I'm still alive. And they, But I don't know what is the next. So, And after that they put me in a little cell with a vicious, hungry dog. <laughs> And when they put me in a room and they close the door and I sit in the middle of the room and 
I was thinking that I'm going to be beaten by the by 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 by, by the dog. Dog, it will um, eat me. It will so. But I was surprised when I found the dog. He just came and sitting in my right hand side. In fact, he licked you on the ear, didn't he? And he licked me in my ears. <laughs> and they must have thought that you were Satan or something they, to have such they, power. They said that. They said that <laughs> this is a human being or something else. They wasn't really. Um, um, they believe they was believe that there is any, there is some spirit or some. So at that point, didn't they, power, yeah. didn't they decide to just turn you over to some guys in a cell and tell them that you had renounced uh, Islam and let them kill you? Uh, yeah. So this is this is uh, the understanding that uh, I've been questioned by professors at the university. I've been fired by the university. To them, mean this guy he just out of Islam now. He's convert now. Um, In fact, they wanted to find out what missionary had converted you, didn't they? Exactly. And you hadn't been converted. E exactly. No, I was have no idea about Christianity in that time. Yes. About Christ, I never even um, um, discussed Christianity. But um, automatically in Egypt, when someone decides to leave Islam, yes. they will accuse him automatically that he became under pressure from church or some Christian, and he converted to Christianity. Well, how in the world did you get out of that situation without losing your life? Um, the, I was crying before the God who was created me in that time. I wasn't know who is. Yes. Um, and uh, after 15 days, uh, my uncle, he was working as the vice president of Egyptian parliament. He was visiting Russia at that time. When he came back and he heard about my, um, my kidnapping and so he came with permission from the government, and he came with his car, and he took me out of the so prison. So you got out of prison due to the political influence of a relative who had been out of the country. Absolutely. And then when you went home, I understand your father tried to kill you. My father, he tried to kill me later, after one year uh, searching for God, uh, find out who is God, you see, till I received a Bible from a Christian pharmacy. So when I read, I start reading the Bible, I start to find the truth about Christ. When I, after I give my life to do to the Lord, I lived uh, one year, uh, one year, whole year as a secret believer. So you when were, my father heard about my conversion, he ooh. shot me with his own gun. He tried to kill me. So you were given a Bible by a Christian pharmacist, and that brought you to the Lord. Yes. And when that happened, your father decided to kill you for the honor of the family, I guess. Uh, because yeah, for uh, he just felt there is a shame. Uh, going to be over him and he, all the life, and, or, or the family, even the community. The and so he shot at you several times and all the bullets missed? No one bullet missed me, about maybe five, six bullets. I understand that your sister mm. finally got your passport, got you out of the country, and where did you go? Uh, when my father, he just uh, shot me and tried to kill me, I was just, I was running away yes. from his face, and I went to my sister, and in my sister's house, uh, I put the whole situation in front of the Lord, and the Lord showed me to get out of Egypt in the same evening, same day. My sister helped me. She, she brought my stuff. And where did you go to when you fled? I fle fled to South Africa by South the road, Africa. traveling from Cairo to South Africa for three months over the road. And uh, I was the first Egyptian who did overland journey between Cairo and Johannesburg um, for take the trip take almost three and, months. Okay, and so then you get to South Africa, and did you meet some Christians there? Yes, in South Africa I met with uh, many Christians and uh, many churches, they start to hear about my story because the public media in South Africa, they wrote articles and published articles about my story. And my Is it true that assassins were sent to South Africa to kill you? Um, absolutely. Um, in South Africa, especially after I wrote my first book in South Africa, and my activity became very well known, and Muslim community, they felt they threatened by that my activity there, and by this book was released there in Johannesburg in 1996, and they tried to end my life there so few this times. So this religion of peace, just because you question Islam, this religion of peace kidnaps you, tortures you, tries to kill you, yeah. and even sends assassins to kill you in South Africa. Yeah. That's some religion yeah. of peace, isn't it? Yeah, this is... Uh, uh, this is how the world really um, been um, um, deceived by the media, by the uh, world media, the secular media, by um, Islam. It's not, uh, it's not religion of peace. Well, Mark, we're going to pause again here, folks, and uh, we'll be back with you in just a moment.
Okay, folks, let's just take a moment to summarize. Mark was a professor of Islamic history at Al-Azhar University in Cairo, and he was also serving as a Muslim imam, the equivalent of a pastor of a mosque, when he would openly question some things about Islam. Uh, he was immediately arrested, he was tortured for several weeks, and when he was finally released and went home, his own father tried to kill him. Uh, you were finally able to escape to South Africa, Mark. Yes. And tell us, when you arrived in South Africa, you said you met some Christian friends. In fact, I think you lived with a Christian family for a while. Yes. But let's just back up for a moment, because uh, I know you became a Christian before you left uh, uh, Egypt. Egypt, yes. What appealed to you about Christianity? Uh, the, uh, before I met with Christ, I lived for 34 years under Islam, believing in Islam, serving Islam, learning about Islam, teaching about Islam. And I lived another year uh, without faith after I find myself, I'm already out of Islam. So I lived for 35 years searching for peace, searching for the true God who is going to show me that he loves me more than anything in this world. Through the Quran, through the teaching of the Prophet of Islam, I was never experienced something like that. So when I get the Bible and from the doctor pharmacy, before I get the Bible, I lived for a whole year searching for God, asking my, myself who God can be. I had terrible headache. Mm. Every day, go to the, the, the uh, doctor pharmacy to get headache tablets. So, and finally she gave me the Bible and she gave me the headache tablets. I took the Bible in one hand and headache tablets in one, another hand. When I started reading the Bible, I met with the Lord Jesus Christ face to face through the Sermon of the Mountain in Matthew chapter 5, mm -hmm. telling me about love. Love your enemy. Not kill your enemy. Not kill your enemy. <laughs> so, the word of the Bible, the word of Jesus Christ, in that evening came to me, it's just like a, a beautiful rain. And so you began to find the peace that had eluded you all those exactly. years. Exactly. For peace, forgiveness. I felt for the first time that my sins has been forgiven. Hallelujah. And I being justified already by the blood of Jesus. I was lived for 35 years with guilt. The guilt of my sin. The guilt of, 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 of um, living as a, as a lost person. I don't know who is going to forgive my sin. I don't know who is going to rescue me from the punishment of Allah. I, am, I don't have no assurance that I can be in the right place, you see, Actually, to live the eternity. In Islam, you never really know for sure whether you're saved or not. Mohammed didn't know whether he was saved or not. Uh, absolutely not. Isn't Absol that something? Yes, this is true. Now, very quickly, we only have about two minutes in this segment. When you finally got to the United States, you were given religious asylum in this country. Yes. And you had a remarkable experience in Washington, D.C. when somebody said that there was a, uh, a Muslim imam who was going to be speaking at uh, a university. George Mason yeah. University, And you went yes. to hear him speak. Yes. And what did you find out about I him? I went there, I, I shocked, I found this man, he was a Baptist pastor from Texas. A Baptist pastor from Texas? He, yeah, and he converted to Islam. <laughs> and he now preaching, you see, for Islam in George Mason um, uh, University and sharing his, his, his uh, testimony. So, and after he finished his speech, uh, he asked if there is anyone who has a question to raise his hand. I find my, my hand it was the first hand. So when I stood up, I did ask him, sir, um, when did you take that decision to leave Christian to become Muslim? He said, eight years. I said, oh, this is like myself. And my next question, since you convert to Islam and you left Christianity, did any church or any Christians order to kill you because the Bible said that the penalty of Christian apostasy is death? He's, he said no. Did the FBI persecuted you here or arrested you here or tortured you here because you left Christianity and become a Muslim? He said no. I said to him, sir, I'm a human being like you. And I have the right to take a decision to change my religion or my faith like you. And I was a Muslim like you. I was an imam as you was a pastor. And I took the same decision you took. But the difference between me and you, that I was treated by Islam. I fired from my university. I kidnapped by the secret police. I've been tortured. I lost my family. I lost my country. And the sword of Islam is on my neck wherever I go. Why? Because the Quran said so. <laughs> that the penalty of 
a Muslim apostasy, it's death. That is an incredible story. And in yes. fact, folks, uh, there's something about this uh, particular story that he did not mention, and that is that when the man stopped speaking and asked for questions, he was the first to raise his hand, stood up, and first of all identified himself as a former professor of Islamic history at uh, the university. And the imam was so impressed by that that he said, oh, Honored professor, please come up here and take over the podium. And the next thing he knew, he was on the stage at the podium exactly. in charge of the whole meeting Absolutely. and asking him questions. Was, yes. Isn't it amazing he how was the Lord shocked. works? Exactly. And, and, and showed immediately yes. that uh, the difference between Christianity and Islam, that, that he leaves Islam and everyone tries to kill him and kicks him out of his family. He leaves Christianity and none of that happens to him. And yet Islam is supposed to be the, the religion of peace. He's still enjoying his life in, in, in America. <laughs> because of the freedom brought to this country through the Christian and the biblical principle. Yes. You know, the point that you made a few moments ago about uh, no one in uh, Islam knowing for sure whether they're ever saved or not, yes. unless they die as a martyr. Yes. Then, then they have the assurance of salvation. Absolutely. Right? But true. otherwise, there's no assurance. Even, again, Mohammed did not know for sure whether he was saved or not. Uh, that, yes. That's a horrible thing to think you're yes. having to earn your salvation, and no matter how hard you exactly. work, you still don't know. Exactly. You still don't know. Exactly. This what is a, true. What a glorious thing it is yes. that uh, to uh, to encounter grace, grace. Absolutely. I was uh, questioning uh, the doctor pharmacy was, was uh, giving me the Bible after Muslims uh, fanatic in Egypt attacking a Christian church. I was so upset. I was so I was so little um, baby Christian. I, I did ask her why people you can defend your church, you defend your people. She what she said to me. She said to me, Mark, I want to say something to you. Our God, he is not in need for us to defend him or to kill others to defend him or to defend his church. Our God, he is strong enough to defend himself, his name, and his people. I want to thank you for tuning in this week. I hope the program has been a blessing to you, and I hope you'll be back with us next week when, the Lord willing, Mark Gabriel will be back with us to discuss the differences in the Bible and the Quran. He will also talk with us about the contrast between Jesus and Muhammad. Until next week, the Lord willing, this is Dave Reagan speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministries saying, Look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. Christ in Prophecy is made possible through the faithful and generous support of viewers like you. Please consider making a donation to Lamb and Lion Ministries so that we can continue broadcasting the message of Jesus' soon return. Thank you, and God bless you. I'd like to invite you to come and check out our website at www.lamblion.com. You will find a wealth of information about Bible prophecy, gaining a big picture view into God's plan for the ages, and learn how His eternal plan relates to you in the here and now. Watch online episodes of Christ and Prophecy for in-depth teachings on end-time events. Read from the library of articles covering all aspects of God's prophetic word. Subscribe free to receive the Lamplighter magazine, e-newsletter, and blog to stay up to date on current events as they relate to Bible prophecy. Equip yourself to share the good news with others using materials from our resource center. Come visit lamblion.com today. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus.